The 2017 Iowa legislative session presses forward and our congressional delegation on recess meets a wall of angry Iowans. We'll cover issues from the state house to the town hall meetings on this edition of Iowa Press. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation, Iowa Community Foundations, an initiative of the Iowa Council of Foundations, connecting donors to the causes and communities they care about, for good, for Iowa, forever. Details at iowacommunityfoundations.org. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. I'm a dad. I am a mom. I'm a kid. I'm a kid at heart. I'm a banker. I'm an Iowa banker. No matter who you are, there is an Iowa banker who is ready to help you get where you want to go. Iowa bankers, allowing you to discover the genuine difference of Iowa banks. Iowa Communications Network. The availability of high-speed broadband service is essential to fulfilling the promise of a connected Iowa. ICN's Broadband Matters campaign showcases the importance of delivering broadband to all corners of Iowa. Information is available at broadbandmatters.com. UIE Care is helping provide access to health care services to more Iowans. By offering online visits with a University of Iowa health care provider, UIE Care helps Iowans seek medical care without leaving home. Learn more at uiecare.com. For decades, Iowa Press has brought you politicians and newsmakers from across Iowa and beyond. Now celebrating more than 40 years of broadcast excellence on statewide Iowa Public Television. This is the Friday, February 24 edition of Iowa Press. Here is David Yepsen. Media watchers, journalists, and everyday Iowans may have had a case of deja vu this past week. A congressional delegation back home on recess facing angry crowds at town halls and elected officials providing few concrete answers. It certainly feels a little bit like the summer of 2009 when the Tea Party movement was emerging, but now it's Democrats and progressive groups pushing back in community centers and gathering places across Iowa. Here to dive deeper into the news of the week, Aaron Murphy is State House Bureau Chief for Lee Enterprises. Kathy Obradovich is the political columnist for the Des Moines Register. Barbara Rodriguez serves as Statehouse reporter for the Associated Press. And Kay Henderson is news director at Radio Iowa. Well, we got a lot to talk about this week, and uh, so we'll put you through your paces here. Kathy, these town halls, you attended a few of those. Uh, are they making any difference? Are they doing any good? You know, it's really interesting. Uh, and you mentioned the 2009 town halls. I, I was covering those with the Tea Party, and I wondered the same thing back then. Is this going to make any difference? In 2009, I think it did make a difference in, the, in terms of the Affordable Care Act. It helped scare Republicans like Chuck Grassley right out of the water uh, when they were, you know, Beginning part, they were working on the bill and they were engaged. Now that uh, Grassley, Joni Ernst are in the majority party, you know, I think their minds are fairly well made up on some of these issues. Uh, but Democrats are still get, they're a little bit heartened by the turnout on these things. They say, you know, this is a this is a way of people showing their engagement on issues, uh, and it is an opportunity then for our organizers, progressive organizers, to identify who those people are, try to get them involved, and keep them involved for the 2018 cycle. And the activism isn't just at the town halls for Iowa's members of Congress; it's at the state house as well. We've seen huge turnout uh, for public hearings. We've seen huge turnout for committee meetings. Uh, so groups are engaged. There was a huge rally uh, of women at the State House uh, that spread all over the Capitol grounds. Uh, so groups on the left are hoping that this is a harbinger of what the Tea Party did in 2010 and had total victory almost at the polls in 2010. In 2010. They're hoping that this is you know, an indication that things are moving their way for 2018. Now, do you have any idea whether they're going to be, whether this will work, bottle and canning this anger? You know, I think a lot of Democrats and, and progressives feel a little bit guilty, you know, that they didn't do enough organizing in Wisconsin, mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, uh, 
Michigan, uh, you know, a few, few a little more votes turned out in those places and we wouldn't be having a lot of these conversations. That's exactly the challenge and that's what's uh, maybe keeping Derek Eden up at night these nights, uh, the new state chairman of the Iowa Democratic Party, is finding a way, as you said, to bottle this energy, this enthusiasm. It's out there, it's palpable. Keeping those people engaged, uh, November 2018 is a long ways away. Uh, for people who aren't normally involved in the process like, like some have become. So, so that's the challenge they face. Keep them engaged, keep, the, keep them involved, um, get them volunteering. Maybe there's people they can convince to run for local offices. That's, that's the big challenge is to bottle that right now. Barbara, I want to welcome you to the Iowa Press Table, your debut appearance here with us. Yay. Welcome to the crew. <laughs> Happy to be here. Uh, before you were... Uh, signed by the Associated Press to Iowa. You told me one of the places you covered was the Wisconsin legislature. Uh, good training for what's going on here. That's right. How I, does it compare? What do you think? Uh, I, you know, it, I started there and uh, it was for the session, the 2012 session. So there's a lot of interesting dynamics with uh, the fallout back then with collective bargaining. There was discussion on voter ID. So I'm seeing a lot of, of similarities there. So it'll be interesting to, to continue to follow that. One thing I learned from watching those, the coverage of the town hall meetings is that I think Chuck Grassley is running in 2022. He beat that <laughs> teenager in a push-ups contest. <laughs> and that's pretty good. For yeah, yeah. Well, I can tell you, he can, he can beat a lot of people who are a lot younger than him, not only in, in push-up contest, but probably, uh, you know, in running mm -hmm. uh, when he keeps running every day. Yeah. So whether that's running for political office, we don't know. Well, We've got a lot of state house issues to get through, and Barbara, I'll, I'll start with you. I want I'm curious what some of the live rounds are on many of these issues, uh, where the status of, of things are. So let's just wade into a lot of these issues. Gun legislation. Uh, what's the status of that? Well, there was legislation that was introduced um, this week that would make sweeping changes to Iowa's gun laws. Um, I mean, everything from using some permit restrictions, um, you know, removing restrictions for background checks for uh, private sales of handguns, um, guns, you know, could be allowed on campus. I think the thing that really stood out on the discussion this week in the legislature was the stand your ground provision, um, which has made an appearance in other uh, legislatures. So, you know, Republicans have have supported a lot of provisions in this bill in the past, and so it'll it'll be interesting to see where it goes from here. And a few of these things have gotten Democratic support when they have been standalone bills and have come up for debate in the Iowa House. So it'll be interesting how Democrats approach this. Uh, Senator Gronstall shepherded through uh, a few years ago the changes to the permitting process for carrying a concealed weapon. This bill makes changes to that, offers a lifetime permit. Um, because Democrats understand that guns are popular, people go hunting, um, guns are sort of ubiquitous in Iowa, and so I think this is going to be an interesting one to watch and see how Democrats sort of split their votes on this. You know, this may not be a slam dunk for Republicans either because a lot, a lot of the law enforcement community, county attorneys, sheriffs, uh, were coming out against uh, the stand your ground provisions, um, saying it will make it harder to prosecute crimes um, and also that, um, you know, concerned that it will change the climate um, for gun ownership and, you know, people's, you know, sense of, you know, where their role is if they're carrying a gun, you know, are they out looking for things, uh, you know, happening that uh, they can then, you know, step in, uh, like, almost like vig vigilante. So there's there's concerns and, and, you know, Republicans tend to listen to law mm -hmm. enforcement and and so are they going to break with that constituency on this bill? And what's your sense? Is there some kind of big gun bill that's going to ultimately be passed? The one that's working through the House right now is, and that's, Kay touched on a little bit, instead of deciding to do these piecemeal, they have it in one big uh, piece of legislation where it's all piled into one, and that seems to be the one that they're um, really working on and, and will ultimately get the up or down vote. So the trains are coming. Yeah. Um, Kay, let's talk about uh, social issues. And there's a lot of things that fall into that category of social issues mm -hmm. in the legislature. Abortion, death penalty, mm -hmm. drugs, anti-sanctuary bill. Right. What's the status of some of this legislation? Well, I was sort of struck by what President Trump said at CPAC 
uh, today, earlier today. He said, basically all I've done so far is keep my promises. And he said the era of empty talk is over. Republicans have historically campaigned on um, peeling back abortion rights, on reinstating the death penalty, on passing gun rights legislation, and uh, in, in some ways getting tough on drugs. You have a new uh, attorney general at the federal level who has suggested that he may crack down on states uh, in regards to marijuana laws. And lo and behold, uh, there was a surprise at the state house this week uh, when a bill that had been seeming to advance that would uh, expand the use of cannabis oil for people with uh, a variety of medical conditions absolutely crashed and burned when it came to committee because Republicans withheld their support. Uh, so I think it's interesting in that Republicans have been addressing these sort of high profile um, combustible issues that they've been campaigning on for years, whereas they haven't been addressing the other part of their agenda, which the era of big government is over. We haven't seen any state agencies closed. Um, the, the cuts that they made to the current year's budget were, were not that seismic. Uh, so I'm sort of fascinated by that. And the other part of that, too, is uh, the business community. I mean, you know, all the talk in the in the campaign was about cutting taxes and creating jobs, right? And we're, you know, we're seeing legislation that might actually um, you know, deal with uh, cutting away the the minimum wage increases that have happened in counties. So that you know that that's not increasing people's paychecks around the state, and we're also not seeing a lot of the business friendly legislation that we might expect from a Republican controlled legislature as well. So uh, I, tax cuts may be a matter of timing. Um, you know, I think that uh, first of all we're more likely to do, see that in an election year. Um, also, Terry Branson has kind of put the lid on what they think they can afford this year. Um, but I, I didn't think that the governor was going to uh, really uh, detour uh, Republicans, especially in the Senate, who have been chomping at the bit for a chance to do this. Aaron, do you think um, what do you think some of these, uh, as Kathy says, some of these popular bills may get shoved off into the election year? In other words, you do all the mean, ugly stuff in the non-election year right. and then come back and hand out the goodies uh, in election year. Is, is that some of what's going on here? That That's possible. It, and it's still possible we could see some things later yet this session, especially when we get into the budget uh, work. We could still see a tax cut um, bill or something else uh, along the economic development lines. But but that is that is an excellent point. There's a good chance that uh, in, this is the year that they tackle the big... It's almost like they're going through the, the party uh, platform, the party planks, right? Every, all the things that... They didn't necessarily campaign on it, but everything that the Republicans have said they've stood for in, in recent years, they're, they're ticking them all off the list now that they have a chance. And maybe next year is, is safe for more of some of the feel-good you know, stuff. Back in the day when I was covering state political conventions, you never paid a lot of attention to those platforms because they didn't do anything. I wonder if a different time is upon us where you better pay attention to those platforms because mm -hmm. they're, they're starting to do what they say they're going right. to do. It may be because I've been telling people, you know, the platforms usually elected officials don't even pay attention, right. so why should we? But, but on that point, on, on some of the social issues as it relates to abortion, I am curious to see where we go from here. There was a lot of discussion at the beginning about uh, funding over Planned Parenthood, but there was also a, a personhood bill that's been introduced. There was a 20-week ban on abortion that's been introduced. There's some discussion of it trying to be um, moving through the legislative process next week, so I think that Republicans will try to, to get that through. What about the death penalty? Is, uh, is that a live round? Are there, is something going to happen there? Well, you know, legislation has been introduced. Um, two, two bills kind of come to mind um, that aim to reinstate the death penalty, which has been abolished for several decades. But, um, you know, I, I'm not sure. You know, we, we asked um, House Speaker Linda Upmeyer this week about it, and she had said that it wasn't something that had been discussed within the caucus. So I'm, I'm curious to see where it goes, if at all, this session. The one thing that occurs to me is that Republicans in Iowa are doing what voters thought Republicans in Congress would do in mm -hmm. Washington, D.C., replace and, re uh, you know, repeal and replace Obamacare, do all these things. And while it seems that there's sort of a stalemate and sort of we, there's no clear agenda on some of those key items that Republicans at the national level uh, ran on, they're getting it done 
here in Iowa. Iowa. Well, and I think though with the death penalty, they are going to probably run into the same thing they did in the mid-90s when Republicans had control of both chambers. Governor Branstad tried to bring forth a, a death penalty, and it's not a clear-cut partisan issue. There, there were Republicans who could not stomach going that far. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's also a fiscal issue these days because it costs a lot of money oh, yeah. um, to have, you know, set up a death row and do those mm -hmm. sorts of things. And so I, I really don't think that they're going to get uh, that bill even to the floor this year. And David, you were at the State House back then when they debated it in 1995. It was fascinating. It passed the House 54 yes votes to 44 no. By the time it was taken up in the Iowa Senate, it failed 39 no votes and only yeah. 11 four. Yeah. So once once the discussion starts going, people get really nervous. And, and the other thing is states are having a hard time finding the cocktail right. to actually put people to I, death. I just wonder if, if something hasn't changed here, if the past is not a good guidance. I mean, as they used to say, it's not your father's Oldsmobile. <laughs> this is not your father's Republican Party anymore either. So does that lend us to think that something like the death penalty could actually have some more traction this time? Aaron? It could. Um, I, I, still, I still tend to agree that it, it's a, a little bit more of an uphill climb, but it's a good uh, point that you raise. I. Uh, before, after the election, before the session, I spoke to some of the leadership who was in the Republican Party 20 years ago. The last time they had the trifecta here at the state house, and 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 it was it was described to me as a, a, a much more moderate agenda that they had uh, then. And at that time, they were saying it will be interesting to see how Iowa Republicans handle this newfound authority this year, and and they've clearly taken it and run with it. Barbara, what's your sense on the death penalty? I mean, again, I haven't been around too long here in Iowa, and I'm, I'm still kind of getting my bearings in, but, you know, for me, I, I find it interesting that this legislation was introduced now in the roughly seventh week of the legislative session, and, you know, if you're going to try to really commit and prioritize the legislation, you kind of try to get it in a little bit earlier. And so for it to come in now, I just don't see the dynamics there at play to make this happen this year. Barbara, you know, another trick from the good old days that I remember is leaders would, reporters were all bored and looking for a story. And so leaders would run these, these hot bills up the pipe, you know, let's legalize the possession of a machine gun in Iowa. And our reporters are, it's news, we write about it, while the, in reality, mm -hmm. you know, the show is going on behind Cole's doors as they write a tax I was going to say, the only other reason you do it that way is if you know you have the support <laughs> already, so you wait until the last second to introduce it. I don't know that that's Kate, what here. about anti-sanctuary bill? You talk about federal... Right. Uh, the, there's a movement in the legislature to pass a law that would uh, deny state tax dollars to cities which offer sanctuary. Um, it doesn't address, you know, churches that might offer sanctuary, but that's a hot button issue that uh, Republican legislators in the House have, have tried to address. Barbara, school choice. Talk about what to where that legislation stands and what it's what it contains. Well, there's been long-standing conversation for you know since the election of this discussion over so-called school choice, giving students and parents more educational opportunities outside of a regular uh, school building. Um, there's been some legislation introduced, but it doesn't appear that we've seen the one, the bill that's going to be moving forward. Um, and so I think the the clock is is ticking because Upmeyer has also referenced that it's a priority for Republicans this year, but I don't think that we've seen the bill that's going to be moving forward. No, Representative Walt Rogers from Cedar Falls, who's chairman of the uh, Education Committee, says he plans to have a, a bill that kind of encompasses school choice. We haven't seen that yet. The, the challenge that they face with that is also a fiscal thing in a tight budget year. If you do anything too expansive on that, whether it's uh, education savings accounts or, or so-called voucher program, that's there's not a lot of money in the state budget as we know already coming in. Kathy, a lot of controversy surrounding the Regents institutions. Mm -hmm. Talk about all that. Yeah, well, so, you know, Republicans have, uh, I think, uh, a uneasy relationship uh, with the state universities. Um, they tend to be the more liberal areas in the state, um, you know, especially Johnson County. Uh, is the only county that Governor Branstad didn't win um, in the last election. So. Uh, he, uh, you know, I think that the, we are seeing bills like um, doing away with tenure. Um, I don't think that bill's going anywhere. But, uh, you know, allowing guns on campus, which would, which would sort of usurp the authority of the Board of Regents, which does the policy for campus. Um, 
you know, uh, there, there was a bill uh, by a, a Republican senator that would require party balance among staff and faculty at universities, which is, um, you know, I've never heard of anything like that before. And so, uh, you know, I don't know how much of that uh, these bills are actually going to go forward. I think what universities really have to worry about is the money uh, and where, you know, where are they, where is their appropriation going to fall? And, you know, right now, the budget cuts that were approved for the current fiscal year, University of Iowa displeased a lot of legislators by clawing back uh, scholarships that had already been awarded to students. So passing that those costs along to students as well. So uh, I think that they're, we're not done hearing about... Um, legislatures, uh, you know, the dome versus, uh, you know, the the, sta about Aaron, the unions. I, I'm sorry, I was just going to say real quick, and the collective bargaining thing impacts that too. There was a lot of concern among uh, university educators with the collective bargaining reform. Yes. And one of the strangest decisions to make is to go after student scholarships. I mean, that just added to the percolating unease about how the universities are run. Well, is that a game the regents are playing with the legislature? It's called Firemen First. <laughs> Cut our budget and we'll fire all the firefighters. Exactly. Cut our budget and we'll do student well, scholarships. Make things horrible for the students so the students and their parents will contact legislators at home and complain. Uh, that seems to be the uh, game plan there. Well, the other thing that's interesting too, it, it gave this opportunity for, for Democrats to come out and say, Republicans, this is their fault because they, they chose not to, to fund the regents adequately. Regents come out and say it's everyone's fault. And, you know, there's this, and, and Republicans also say, you know, the Board of Regents didn't have to do it that way. And so there's a lot of yelling back and forth and in the, in the process, I mean, it's, it's unclear whether students are going to be able to get the scholarships that they need. Kathy, is uh, SIU President Leith in trouble uh, over guns on, on yeah, campus? Yeah, Iowa State. Case, his own guns? <laughs> Iowa State President Leith. So I don't think, it, I don't think it's guns, um, but uh, you know, there was a, a criminal investigation into his use of uh, the uh, university airplanes. Uh, that appears to have gone away now. Um, and and he has had the support of the regents, um, you know, going through. But well, what about uh, that the process. legislature? Has he, has he got the support of the legislature? I, you know, I have not I have not heard serious uh, you know pushback against him. Um, you know, I do think that the regents are going to have to shore up their policies on you know things like use of transportation um, and and to you know push off legislators trying to get in there and do it for them. Um, that, I think that would just be prudent on their part. Barbara, is there a danger here that uh, even though these things are not live rounds, they have a real demoralizing effect on the, leg on the faculty and the people on campuses? I mean, just with what happened with collective bargaining too, uh, there's this, just this theme of, you know, does the legislature um, hate, you know, teachers or uh, is a legislature aimed at, at trying to, you know, knock down higher education in, in Iowa and, and make us less competitive. I mean, d not, it's unclear what will move forward, but it certainly gives, again, Democrats fodder for, you know, trying to get ready for 2018 as well. And so, you know, is that strategy the best for Republicans or they think that it's, you know, there's enough time between now and 2018 where they can be talking about some of these bills? Robert, go back to Wisconsin again. Um, you know, what was the effect on, on the, the University of Wisconsin, a wonderful university system, uh, with what the legislature did there? faculty leave? Uh, what, did, what was the effect there? I didn't follow it too closely, but there was, I mean, there has been some comparisons with, at least with collective bargaining, where, you know, there was less uh, competition, uh, you know, there was staff that that left the state and, and the rankings of, of the university may have gone down in that process. So I think, you know, Iowa, individuals in Iowa that feel strongly about this issue try to see what's happening in other states to say, we don't want to become what yeah. That state, what happened yeah. there, and that's very, I think it's, it's possible that they may do the same thing with Wisconsin. Yeah, coming out of Illinois for the last seven years, I can tell you that uh, faculty, good faculty there are looking for jobs elsewhere, and good faculty don't want to come to Illinois, but that's for another day. Okay, uh, let's switch gears entirely. Waterworks. 
What's going on with the Des Moines Water Works in the legislature? Well, as uh, most Iowans know, there's a lawsuit filed by the Des Moines Water Works challenging the way three northwest Iowa counties manage uh, drainage and the idea that uh, ag chemicals are getting in the Des Moines wa Water Works water drinking supply. Um, there's a bill moving in the House and in the Senate that would sort of snap back and try to change the governance of the Des Moines Water Works uh, with supporters hoping that maybe that lawsuit might go away. Uh, on a separate path, uh, there is a bill emerging to have the state spend more money and a dedicated source of money to clean up surface water in the state. Uh, Republicans in the House tried a plan last year that didn't go anywhere in the Senate. Um, so they're discussing ways in which the state can invest more money uh, because you have small communities out there who have drinking water supplies that need to be cleaned up. You have small communities out there who have sewer systems that aren't working. You have a lot of infrastructure problems out there and that's what that bill may in the end, address. Aaron, uh, is that uh, the, the bill changing the, the line, the, the, the structure of the Des Moines Water Works? Is that just a farm bureau, farmer, rural deal to stick it to the big city of Des Moines? There are some who would tell you that this is purely motivated uh, by the lawsuit um, and, and also that it um, is uh, something of an erosion of local control, which is something the Republicans traditionally are supportive of. You know, the governor wanted to. Uh, bring this water uh, bill forward last year and he had a funding mechanism that legislators didn't like um, and now legislators I think it was motivated I think by the by the lawsuit now legislators are just going directly at Des Moines Water Works and I'm interested to see if, how interested they are in really putting a lot of money into water quality and it's also kind of interesting with water quality it was such a dominant topic in the legislature last year and and it's it's one of many things this year. And so I, you know, I believe that Republicans will be able to get a piece of legislation out as it pertains to water quality, um, you know, without the, the publicity of, of last year. Barbara, we got less than a minute left. Real quickly, minimum wage. Is the state legislature going to, what are they going to do the minimum wage? Well, they've indicated for a couple of weeks now that they're interested in a, a preemption a law which would basically ban counties from raising the minimum wage above. Pass? You know, there's support in the, the, from Republican leadership, so I can see that happening. And Kathy? Bottle bill. A bottle bill. So they've been, they have been trying for decades uh, to kill the bottle bill, the five cent deposit. Uh, grocery stores hate it. Um, they hate having to take the deposits. Uh, I think they have a good chance to do that this year if they get serious about it. Wow. We've got a lot on our plate up there at the State House. We're out of time here, but we'll be back on a lot of these issues. Thanks for joining us. And again, Barbara, welcome to the table. We'll return with another edition of Iowa Press on March 17th at our regular Friday night time of 7.30 before festival programming that weekend. For all of us here at Iowa Public Television, I'm David Yepsen, and thanks for joining us today. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation, Iowa Community Foundations, an initiative of the Iowa Council of Foundations, connecting donors to the causes and communities they care about, for good, for Iowa, forever. Details at iowacommunityfoundations.org. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. I'm a dad. I am a mom. I'm a kid. I'm a kid at heart. I'm a banker. I'm an Iowa banker. No matter who you are, there is an Iowa banker who is ready to help you get where you want to go. Iowa Bankers, allowing you to discover the genuine difference of Iowa banks. Iowa Communications Network. The availability of high-speed broadband service is essential to fulfilling the promise of a connected Iowa. ICN's Broadband Matters campaign showcases the importance of delivering broadband to all corners of Iowa. Information is available at broadbandmatters.com. UIE Care is helping provide access to health care services to more Iowans. By offering online visits with a University of Iowa health care provider, UIE Care helps Iowans seek medical care without leaving home. Learn more at uiecare.com.